Uh, thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. Uh, first, I would like to thank Sadhan Sir at Department of Energy for honoring me with this opportunity to deliver a talk as an alumni of our esteemed department. So as I already mentioned, I will be giving a talk on this electric vehicle charging infrastructure and what are the impacts that it has on the system, on the grid as a whole. So a brief summary of this presentation. First, I will go into the need and why we need to electrify our transportation sector the different charging technologies that we have and the impacts of these charging technologies on the grid. Then we'll be looking at the, what are the global practices of EV integration that is practiced by different network operators, system operators in the, in the world today. And then we'll look at a few measures on how we can mitigate the impacts of EV charging. I'll be planning a few slides on the Indian EV ecosystem, and then finally we'll be concluding with the future scenario. So as we all know, this uh, pollution or this climate change is a big factor or a big uh, proponent in today's times. And, and if you look at the carbon emission based on sector-wise uh, uh, sectors, we'll see that transportation has significant role. 23% 23 of all carbon emissions in 2021 was because of transportation. The, the one the other important uh, sectors is the electrical generation we know. But transportation is also a vital component. And if we look at within this transportation, we can see that the emission by light duty vehicles, which typically are four wheeler vehicles, they, they form the majority of the portion. So if we look at different transport types, of 2020, the major of, of almost 50% of the pollution was due because of these light duty vehicles. So if we were, are able to electrify this transport sector, but here, one is to say this, just electrification would not do. Because if we electrify this transport sector, it will be dependent on where we get the energy from. If we are getting the energy from our traditional power sources, then the emission will just shift from transportation to our electricity, electricity generation. So a uh, synergy between this electric, electrification transportation and renewable generation needs to be uh, designed so that the overall the global emissions are reduced. And so in today's world, we are, we are mainly looking at electrification of two wheelers and three wheelers, light duty vehicles or four wheeler component and the, and the buses and heavy trucks. So aviation is still way off on if you can electrify aviation, but the load transportation are first targeted for electrification. Now look, the electrification of this transport sector has started around a decade back. If you look at the number of electric vehicles, and these are just for your uh, private, like your for light duty vehicles. These are not including your heavy duty vehicles. So if you look at UK and USA, you can say since 2010, this journey of elect, uh, electric, electric vehicles have started. Now we have two types of vehicles. One is the battery electric vehicles, which are run just on the battery, and the other is the plug-in hybrid, which are hybrid of battery source and a petroleum-based source. Now, initially, plug-in hybrid vehicles had some uh, success, but in the recent last five years, electric vehicles has boomed. So electric vehicles is no doubt it's one of the most fastest growing transportation sector right now. Now Norway is special in this regard because Norway started its electrification journey a bit earlier than the other countries. So in fact, in 2020, so in the last year of the of all the vehicles sold in Norway, almost 90% of those vehicles were electric vehicles. So this is significant. So if you see of, of the entire country, of the all the vehicles sold in that country for that year, 90% electric vehicles. So even though this journey has started, if we look at the Norway's vehicle stock as a whole, we can see that even now, electric vehicles just comprise 12% of Norway's personal vehicle stock. Still, now the 43% of the uh, vehicles are diesel and 35% are gasoline or petroleum based. Only 12% of the vehicles have been electrified in Norway till now. So even though the journey has started, it will take some time until the transportation sector is electrified up to a, certain, up to a commendable uh, ratio. Now, if we look at the energy electricity demand for EV charging, so if you see, if you look at that, overall, 
China is dominating that because China has one of the largest electrified bus fleets. So if you look at this graph, the bus fleet of China is tremendously used of the elect uh, electrified uh, bus fleets. Compared with the other uh, US and Europe, they don't have any bus fleet compared co in comparison to China. But in other, let's say in cars, Europe has highest amount of electric cars globally. But the thing is, if we look at electricity demand as a comparison with the total load, so if the energy demand for electric vehicles just comprises of only 0.25% in case of China, 0.125% per, in case of USA and less than 0.1% for Europe. So the electrification transportation would not hasn't yet a significant burden on the energy consumption of the of energy consumption of the country. Now the thing differs. The, although the energy may not be significant, the power consumption is significant. So what this means is although all on average over the year the energy consumed by electricals would not be significant. But on the last mile delivery, that is the delivery to the distribution sector, distribution system and the uh, transmission system, that may be significant because the electric vehicles may be connected to the peak during the peak load periods, so which may lead to overburden, overburdening of the system. So we have to look into that. So if we look, so if we go charging technologies on how we can charge, in, charge electric vehicles, we have different classification categories. We can classify the charging based on the charging speed, which is typically based on how long does it take for a charger to charge the electric vehicle, means slow, medium, or fast. Then we have different charging modes. So these are typically uh, these modes are defined by your the level of security or the level of protection that we have in the chargers. Then if AC charging and DC charging, then we have based on use case whether chargers are for private use, whether they're public use or they're same public use. Then we have the classification based on whether the chargers are plug-in, that is a typical when you plug in the charger to your electric vehicle, swap, that is whether you swap the battery as a whole and put in a new battery, and wireless, whether there is a possibility of wireless charging. Now, electric vehicles also have a uh, unique characteristic that it can provide bidirectional charging, that is it can receive energy as well as can deliver energy. So some electric vehicle chargers has the capability to deliver energy back to the grid. Then we have classification based on standards. These can be national standards or international standards. So what is important overall is the mainly the uh, classification AC and DC charging. So in AC charging, typically it's the, the charger itself is inside the body of the electric vehicle. Then we have an electric vehicle supply equipment, which is called EVSC. This EVSC supplies the power or supplies the AC input to the charger that is present in the electric vehicle. And then the charger converts the AC to DC and then charges the battery. In DC charging, the charger is outside the vehicle. The charger is on the grid side. And we feed in the DC current or DC power directly to the vehicle. So because of this, DC charger typically has higher power rating since the charger is placed outside the vehicle. Now, if you look at the different, uh, the global infra, the global charging infrastructure. So here you can see that up to 2019, public rapid chargers were not significant. Where, where, pri where private chargers were significant. This is when we say private charger has a higher number of degrees because every vehicle you buy generally comes with a charger itself. So therefore, private charger, the amount of private charger is high. And as of 2020, we had less than, uh, we had 9.92 million less than 22 kilowatt chargers. And of this maximum were in China, as expected, 50% of these moderate chargers, this less than 22 kilowatt was in China. Now we have other category of chargers, the fast chargers. So this is greater than 22 kilowatt chargers. And of this, we have uh, almost close to 0.4 million fast chargers out of 2020. Now the important scenario is if we if we uh, if we look at the uh, growth or the trend of this charging infrastructure in UK. So initial in the initial growth periods, the slow chargers were generally implemented. So slow charger is slow charger. This is three to five kilowatt chargers. Now why is that? Because the earlier electric vehicles didn't have the technology or didn't have the battery technology to be specific to accept higher amount of power. But in 
improving battery technology, the energy and the power density of the batteries have increased. Because of that, we have seen the growth of fast chargers, the 720 kilowatt chargers. And in the recent five years, there's, there's a fast growth of rapid chargers, the typical 50 kilowatt chargers. And we have now also seen the growth of more than 100 kilowatt chargers. So one, one charger has a power capacity, may have a capacity of 150 kilowatt to 400 kilowatt. So that is significant. Now imagine a situation when you are integrating one charger of 150 kilowatt connected to a grid. So it puts a tremendous, tremendous amount of stress on the grid. Now, if we cross compare among different countries, of, in all the countries, we can say fast charging is dominating right now. So 17, 21, 22 kilowatt rated, rated chargers are dominating across these five countries. And similar trend is seen among all the countries which, has, which have a dedicated EV market. Now, the other part is, so one I described based on your power rating. The other uh, classification that is of importance is based on the connector types. So these connector types are the plugs that will fit into electric vehicles. So in USA, we have this type one connector plug where we have this uh, live and neutral and earth and these two communication pins. Then this is a type one CCS plug, which is used for DC charging. And as we all know, Tesla has its own connector plug, which they use for the proprietary charging. In Japan, predominantly shadow mode DC charging connector is used. So this is predominantly used for DC charges. It's shadow mode is not meant for each other, it's just for DC charging. Then in Europe, if you go to Europe, we have type 2 AC charging. So these are this is type 2 AC, uh, AC connectors, and we have CCS2 connector plugs. Then if you come to China, we have the GBT, which is used for GBT, AC, GBT AC plug and GBT DC plug. So you see, depending on the market. Uh, depending depending on your nation uh, on your on, an, uh, on a locality we have different standards for ev charging now this creates a difficulty because if i am a manufacturer i have to create different connector types if i want to send my vehicle in different countries and also if i am a if i if i if i am a charging station owner i have to understand what is my market like what kind of vehicles are there in my locality so that i can accordingly design my charging station. So we have different types of these connector types in uh, the EV ecosystem as of now. And uh, it is a safe bet to say that CCS2, this uh, CCS2 and type 2 and type 1 and CCS1, these are going to dominate. So these are more or less right now the standards uh, observed across the world. Now looking at the impacts on EV charging. so. Electric vehicle, now why does it create this impact? Because electric vehicle charging load has some unique characteristics. So for a distribution system operator, this electric vehicle load are a new type of load. The distributor operator doesn't yet know uh, on how on the characteristics of the electric vehicle load. So because of this newness, the, it is difficult to forecast the load, the charging load. Now, why is this important? Because when uh, when we look at how the electrical network operates, the distribution net distribution operator creates a forecast, and accordingly, there the power is dispatched by uh, in, uh, at, at, at the load dispatch centers. Now, if you are unable to accurately dis uh, accurately forecast our load, it becomes difficult to accordingly dispatch power for, for the system. So there is a requirement that the distribution operators have a firm understanding of the charging load. Now, why is the charging load different? Because this charging load, it, it depends on the travel behavior of the EV users, on when does the uh, user travel, when does he charge, how much does he charge, how much does he travel, what is his energy requirement, then whether he's charging at private uh, place or a public place or, doing work or, or, or in his workplace, because if he's charging his private, house then he'll be generally operated generally charging during the night when he is asleep if he's going for public charging then he'll be uh, charging during the day if he's going to workplace charging he'll be charging in the day so these kinds of characteristics makes it difficult to accurately focus your uh, ev charging load the other side of it is the charging characteristics so the developing this uh, battery technology has increased the power rating of the battery as i've already told you and 
for a same electric vehicle, the charging power is different if it's charging using AC charger. It's different if it's charging for DC charger. Then the charging power is also different based on your state of charge of the battery. At low state of charge, at low SOC of battery, the charging power is generally high. And during high state of, state of charge, the charging power is generally low. Then based on your uh, charger and your EVSC, the minimum value of that will be your charging power. That is, let's say your electric vehicle has a capacity of uh, 7 kilowatt charging and your charger has a capacity of 20 kilowatt charging, but you are uh, bottleneck by electric vehicle charger. So you'll be charging only at 7 kilowatt. So because of these parameters, it is difficult for estimation of this or for forecasting of this electric vehicle load. And because of this vision, it has become difficult for the grid operators to optimally uh, control the system. Right now, since the number of electric vehicles are low, so such kind of uh, instable, unstable operating uh, uh, times are not seen because the electric vehicle numbers are quite low. But with steadily increasing numbers, if not correctly maintained or if not correctly controlled, this electric vehicle may become a significant difficulty for a system operator. Now, if you look based the issues based on location, let's say for a new home or if a new uh, residential, uh, this concern new residential property, it's not difficult because if I need an electric vehicle charger, then I can accordingly uh, size the cable or I can accordingly go for a new, uh, new uh, contractual connection. For new homes, it's not a problem to include an EV. But let's say you have an existing home. In case of an existing home, someone from the system operator uh, from the this, uh, this com needs to come and assess your uh, current contracted demand then if if that under the current contract demand you don't have enough capacity to install the charger then you need to uh, increase your contracted demand now based on that they they, they need to change the service cables now that this comes you also need to check whether because of increase in your contracted demand whether it overloads the distribution to the transformer. If it overloads the transformer, then they also need to change the transformer, update the transformer. So a significant amount of time and money would need to be invested in this. The other is next on street charging. Not all the vehicles or, or not all the users have their own dedicated parking spaces. In India, if you see most of the people in dense urban areas, they park the vehicle on the roadside. Now, if they transition to electric vehicles, where they charge? For that, we need to have public uh, chargers that are easily available. So one of the solution is we can use existing street furniture such as light posts, distribution towers, and retrofit them to accommodate an EV charger. However, if we go by this route, we need to upgrade our uh, network accordingly. The next is for workplace and fleet users. Now, every workplace already has a contractual demand. Now the workplace, if they uh, provide an electric vehicle charging station, let's say it has charge of 10, it is providing a charging station of 10, 10 chargers. Then accordingly, it may have the contractual, uh, it may have margin in its uh, services, but if it's not there, then they also may need to go for upgradation. Finally, we have the highway charging station. So in the high, for interstate travel, we need highway charger, charge charge that, that are essential. And these chargers are typically highly rated as 50 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt, 150 kilowatt. And also these charging stations would be far from your nearest system operator or distribution system operator. So a significant amount of cabling would be required to power these charging stations. Now, from a technical point of view, electric vehicles presents these kinds of issues. So we have voltage issues. That is, we may we have we may have voltage stability issues, we may have phase imbalance issues, we may have under voltage or voltage slag issues. Then we have increase in peak load. That is, if the electric vehicles are connected during the already peak periods, if the peak load will further increase. Due to the increase in peak load, it may lead to congestion in the in your distribution feeders. And because of this, the, the power losses will increase. Then there is issue of power quality because of because these are your um, power ethnic based uh, sources or loads, they will inject harmonics in the system, which also gives rise to voltage flickers. And because of that, we may have reliability issues in the system also. Now, if we do the distribution network, so this side is your 
medium voltage or high voltage side and you have a substitution transformer and then finally here is a uh, loads typical loads connected now because of this electric vehicle load first we may have overloading in these equipments this uh, breakers the substation transformers distribution transformers we may have overloading in these equipments then we may have congestion in these distribution feeders then we'll have voltage set typically at the end user to, at the end user so these uh, loads may face your voltage sags and then we'll have harmonic injection from the load side towards the grid side so this is a case study done in melbourne uh, where they took uh, a rural feeder and then they uh, connected and they did connected different amounts of electric vehicles and see and, uh, and studied what was the impact on the feeder so they, uh, they uh, for analysis they took realistic charging data which was taken from this uk ev trial electric nation in where they studied the char charging pattern of actual electric vehicle users and then they use this uh, data to plug into their own uh, methodology so what they found was up to 20% e penetration that is 20% of your residential properties would have an electric vehicle up to that the uh, loading in your transformers can be made control or like just two transformers were overloaded up to 20% penetration but as the penetration went up higher and higher more number of transformers started getting overloaded so now because of this if transformers are getting overloaded you would need to replace the transformers you need to upgrade the transformers and this overloading is generally seen during these peak periods because you are not controlling electric vehicle charging in these peak periods where in the evening periods which are already the peak periods you are further adding more load into the bigger peak periods which has led to overloading of your transformers then these uh, users they also reported that the voltages were getting uh, deteriorated so after, at, till 40 percent there was okay so voltage was not deteriorated so after, if you go for higher penetration you can see during the again the peak periods the voltage at the customer end was not within the permissible operational bands so as per australian uh, recommendation the voltage has to be between 0.94 per unit and 1.1 per unit but during the peak periods the voltage at the customer end where went below your 0.94 per unit which was not permissible so this is what happens if we do we, if you don't have any control of electric vehicle charging so it may lead to your significant uh, uh, stresses on the system now this is the case of uh, shown i've shown a case of norway because norway has, has the highest amount of electric vehicle load in in the in the world and as per their analysis if all of the vehicles in norway of all the passenger vehicles in norway was to be electrified an addition of six percent of the, the country's total demand would be uh, added because of electric vehicle load which is not significant so it means that if all of the uh, fake passenger vehicles in norway is to be electrified it will only lead to addition of six percent addition uh, total demand so again this written the point that the impact on the energy consumption is not significant but comparatively if we look at the power consumption that is if every household has a power consumption increased by one to two kilowatt then it will lead to overload in nearly 10 percent of all transformers of norway which is significant and this is just because of increase of power by one to two kilowatt now electric vehicles have a power consumption around seven kilowatts so this impact is going to be significant then uh, again this is the on a household level so if you see in a household level we all have a contractual demands so typically on a summer in this case now so typically in the summer the household peak is not high because uh, it's prison weather but in winters the household peak increases because they need to use the heaters now if we use it if, uh, if we use a electric vehicle charger and if your contractual demand was 99 kilowatt then you're overshooting your contractual demand and if it's extra cold then even with a plug-in hybrid charger which typically has lower uh, charging capacity even that has overshooted your uh, contractual demand and this is for norway so in norway this uh, uh, power connections are typically 9 kilowatt or 12 kilowatt in india it's 
far less in india it's around 4 to 5 kilowatt even lower so you can understand why the system operators are worried about the electric vehicle charging load the other point is the phase imbalance so phase imbalance occurs when there is unequal distribution of load among the three phases of the system now the uh, 7 kill up to 7 kilowatt generally the charges are single phase but more than 7 kilowatt charges are generally three phase so three phase charges won't have this issue but if we are integrating uh, single phase chargers then the discom has to take the priority on where the charges will be placed the discom has to control that place charge uh, place charger one and phase a place charger two and phase b the discom has to control that the other way is we can go for smart charging so this is this paper talks about how utilizing smart charging we can control the phase imbalance due to EV charging. So if in smart charging we control the charging of electric vehicles based on some grid parameters. So what they showed was in uncoordinated, if we don't have any control over charging, the phase was loaded up to 40 kilowatt. The, in the feeder, the phase A was loaded at 40 kilowatt, phase B was loaded at 30 kilowatt, is a peak load I'm talking about, and phase C had a peak load of 30 kilowatt. Now the introduce smart charging so that is in smart charging what they did was if the peak if the peak loading of the phase increased then they stop the load uh, they stop loading and uh, stop the charging until and unless all the phases are uh, the loaded all, all the phases are equal again so in smart charging they control the charging so that your uh, loading and all the phases are equal now in india this in, uh, problem of phase involved be important because india has a high number of two wheelers and three wheelers and these charges are typically single phase charges. So if you look at the global practices in UK, uh, some of the, so these global practices are not exhaustive. I've just highlighted a few of the commendable approaches that has been taken up by the different system operators. So for, for integration of electric vehicle charging in UK, what the, the system operators have done is so prior to installation of a charger, the user has to apply or has to get approval from the respective operators uh, and the operators would visit the uh, user's home and inspect their property. If they have sufficient amount of uh, margin to install the EV charger, then they would give the approval that you can install EV chargers. And the operators would also look at the uh, distribution, either distribution or uh, headroom with the distribution transformer of the uh, of the user. So if there is available headroom, then they uh, approve the installation. Otherwise, they do not approve the installation until unless the transformer has been replaced. Now, because of that, what they have done is they create a, a publicly accessible map. So this map can be accessed by any uh, residence or any commercial entity. What this map shows is it gives the loading or it gives the available margin at the different distribution substations in, in, in its op op operating region. So in, if it's green, then it, it means there is sufficient uh, margin and you can go and install the EV chargers. If it's yellow, it means that it has limited margin and so uh, the discom has to play a much greater role in determining whether the margin is available or not. So this kind of a uh, hands-on approach has been taken by UK and this is commendable. So they are look, they are uh, looking at the impacts of EV charging in detail and so that the EV charging load doesn't create a bottleneck in the system. Now in case if you go to California, we all know that California was one of the states which promoted your solar rooftop solar heavily. Because of this promotion, they they uh, face something known as duck curve. So this is a duck curve where during the noon periods, because of high solar generation, the effective load of the system, net load system, took the shape of a duck or took the shape of a swan. Now, because of this, it was uh, estimated that it may so happen that the solar generation is so high that it is not uh, sustainable for your power generating units to generate power because your price of the electricity is quite low. So now what the California has come up with is they have introduced a time-based tariff for electric vehicle charging. What they did was up till 3 a.m. they noted the solar generation should be high. So up till 
if you charge electric vehicle up to 3 a.m., then you are levied very little uh, tariff, electricity tariff. But if you charge at the peak periods, the charging cost increases. So they segregated the tariff for electric vehicle charging based on time of use. What so what it did was it increased the load in the system during periods when the net load was low, and it reduce the addition of load in the system when the load of the system was already high. So it is another approach that took in controlling in kind of passively controlling a EV charging. Now in Germany, so Germany launched uh, as per as per so Stromnetz Berlin is the distribution system operator at Berlin in Germany. And in their territory, they mentioned that the uh, houses generally typically have available contracted capacity to able to, to accommodate living lower charger. So they, the power capacity of the Germany's residences or Berlin residences were able to accommodate these chargers. And they also had the system that the EV user had to go and register the charging unit with the network operator prior to installation of chargers. Now Germany released two different grid, uh, uh, your regulations that the chargers need to comply with. Comply with one is VDER and 4100 and one is 4105. Now, although this uh, goes in different aspects, what is important is the so Germany what they did was if your charger is a DC charging and it has a uh, capacity of greater than 12 kVA, then the grid operator can request reactive power capability. So it, it, it means that if you are a charger, DC charger which typically is obviously always greater than 12 kilowatt, then you are required to have the capability to provide this uh, reactive power to the grid. This is unable your voltage control. Now, there is also requirement mentioned in these regulations that these grid operators can request your uh, electric vehicle chargers to provide active power responses during your grid events. So Germany has uh, created these advanced regulations for that purpose. Now, if you look at Denmark, so Denmark is one of the most uh, advanced countries when it comes to this ancillary services and grid, grid support requirements. So Denmark has already come up with your grid code requirements, which mention how the electric vehicles should perform in case of any grid event. And they have also, uh, and they have allowed electric vehicles to participate in provision ancillary services. So as per the Danish grid code, so electric vehicles charging station based on different rated power. So if, if the rated power is less than 11 kilowatt, then it has different requirements. If the rated power is 11, 15 kilowatt, this, it has different requirements. And these are the requirements that, that the charging station should have. So let's say for A1 category, it should have over-frequency response. It should have uh, a uh, absolute power limit. It should have ramp, ramp rate limit. It should have, have reactive power control. It should have power factor control. So these kind of control functions have been mandated by your Danish grid code so that this electric vehicle charging stations are in a position where they can help support the grid in case of a event. So, <coughs> sorry. So we say that electric vehicles can impact the grid, but the Danish grid codes have been formed in such a way that electric vehicles would be used to help support the grid during the case of grid events. Now, what Sweden has been doing is Sweden Although it has these charging stations, what unique the unique uh, project going on in Sweden is it has gone wireless EV charging. So Sweden, there is a project known as Smart Smart Road Gotland, where they have placed uh, wireless chargers underneath the roads, and whenever a vehicle moves over these wireless chargers, if it's uh, certified, if it's certified by the project, then while you're moving or while transportation, the vehicle is being charged. So under the asphalt, you place these copper coils and uh, these copper coils then have some communication with the electric vehicle. And while the vehicle is moving, they, it's getting charged. So what this does effectively reduces the requirement of high battery capacities. Since you're charging the vehicle continuously, so you can have long distances at small battery sizes. But this is still a future technology and is still in the pilot pilot uh, phase right now. Now we have talked about the impacts of EV charging. So how can we mitigate these impacts? So the straightforward way is you need to increase the distribution network, you need to upgrade the distribution net network. But this is costly. As we all know, upgradation of a system is costly. 
So uh, I have shown the example of two different topologies, uh, distribution system topologies. One is the low voltage distribution system topology, and one is the high voltage distribution system topology. Now, for both the situation, if we add 250 kilo or 250 kV of uh, of uh, upgradation, that is, the system is upgraded to accommodate 250 kV extra capacity. Then, in one case, we are spending 21 lakhs. Other case, we are spending 30 lakhs. A significant investment. The other way we can go is implement smart charging. So smart charging is one of the most uh, useful, uh, promising technologies that can help in accommodation electric vehicle charging. So what's essentially in smart charging? What we do is we control the charging of electric vehicle. We we control the charging current based on some grid parameters. So the grid operator or the aggregator or a charging station would be looking at what is the current loading of the feeder or current voltage of the feeder and based on those measurements they will control your charging current of your of your charging so we have different types of smart charging as of now we have basic control which is just on off the start or stop the charging based on your grid conditions we have time of use study that we show in case of california then we have unidirectional control charging that is a controlling if you are finitely controlling the uh, you are minutely controlling the your EV charging current. Then you have bidirectional charging, that is you are providing charging to the grid. Then you have bidirectional V2X, that is you are providing char uh, charge energy to your local building or local home or local load. Then you also dynamic pricing. Now each of the different types of application have different kind of possible uses. But right now all of these are in under partial market deployment. So we have TOU tariff, that is time of use tariff, which is being uh, implemented quite rapidly so in uk it's been implemented in india also different policies have mentioned the implementation of time of use tariffs so you just need a smart meter to implement this time of use tariffs for ev charging so this is it has high maturity but for other kinds of smart charging projects they are still in the initial phase of market deployment we have uh, uh, commercial products we have commercial product basic control we have commercial products of unidirectional control but still they are not widespread as of yet now that was your so using this smart charging we can control this loading and condition of this grid now for power quality issues it depends on where you place AV chargers as we all know this high amount of active power drawn from the grid would lead to higher amount of voltage sag in the grid so based on where you place these fast chargers you can control the voltage sag then you can go for smart charging for uh, power quality issues uh, as i always told you then we go for distributed smart single phase chargers so that their phase imbalance is controlled. Then we have automated and controllable tap changes on the distribution transformers so that the secondary voltage is maintained at an acceptable level. Then we can, obviously this is well known, we can have reactive power sources at these uh, feeders. Then we, uh, it is also need to control the harmonic injection. It is needed that these chargers or electric vehicle chargers needs to be regulated by standards. So prior to prior to sale of electric vehicle charge in the market, it must be tested to meet certain standards. The other way to maintain con to uh, overcome condition is the use of RE, RE integrations. So renewable energy can be integrated as a captive plan. It can be integrated as, through tariffs. That is, you give preferential tariffs when RE generation is high. Then renewable energy can be procured using open access. RE generation business can be used as a separate charging business itself that is based on RE, RE, RE charging this charging businesses would optimally uh, increase or decrease the charging power and we also have upgrade of off renewable energy, energy charging stations which are typically used for in case of emergencies or in case of uh, rural areas where the grid, grid connection is still lacking now the use of the RE generation would help reduce the GHG emission as I already told you just transitioning to electric vehicles is not sufficient to ensure that your uh, greenhouse gas emissions come down. So to ensure that the GHG emissions are reduced, we need to integrate renewable energy into this electric vehicle charging uh, regime. Then this onset R resources, if, if I have a captive R generation, then the, uh, in, the, then the amount of energy that draw from the grid is reduced. So I can reduce my charging cost. So they also help in uh, they also help reducing grid congestion because we already know that RE by this distributed RE sources 
they have a issue of this bidirectional power flow to the grid. So if I increase the load in the local distribution source generation itself, then I reduce that uh, congestion issue. Yeah, so this this RE renewable energy source electric vehicles are like are well synergized technologies. So one is a generation technology, one is a load. So these two are well synergized. Oh, we can synergize them well so that the overall impact is net positive. So if you look at the Indian ecosystem, so Indian ecosystem is still at the nascent stage. And right now we have around 6.6 .6 lakhs electric vehicles, but these are mostly a three wheelers. So India has a lot of electric three wheelers and two wheelers in four wheeler category is still limited. We just have around 16,900 four wheelers, but these three wheelers and two wheelers are dominating in Indian electric vehicle market. And its three wheelers are generally powered by lead acid instead of lithium ion. And so the power capability, the charging capacity of these are limited. If you look at the charging infrastructure up to 2021, the government of India under the FAME incentive have, in, uh, have placed this um, tender for installation of 2,877 charging stations. Now inside each charging station, there will be different charging points. So this should ensure that there is a uh, well-designed charging charging station map in the country. So besides this uh, government, the few uh, private players have also been active in this area. For example, Fortum, Magenta Power, Tata Power, they all have installed charging stations throughout India. In fact, Tata Power has installed more than 1,000 chargers of, in India as of the August 21. So this shows the map on where the government have installed. So as you can see in Maharashtra, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, uh, Tamil Nadu, different number of electric vehicle uh, charging stations has been uh, or installed or is about to be installed under this frame incentive. But in the Indian scenario, there are different uh, challenges. So one is the these charging stations that are being uh, floated or that are being installed in India, primarily AC zero charge and DC zero chargers. So these two charger types are India only charge, charger type chargers. And AC zero one is a three kilowatt charger and DC zero one is a 15 kilowatt charger. And the vehicles that use DC zero one is limited. Only Mahindra vehicles use these DC zero one chargers. So because there was not enough market study, there is a mismatch between the vehicles present in the market and the chargers that have been set up by the government. In India, the common charging uh, chargers, or uh, common vehicles that have come up, that is the Tata Nexon, it uses the CCS2 charger charging uh, charge technology. But the government of India has focused on your AC01, DC01, because these are, these are low cost chargers. And these load charges are not preferable because if there is a public chargers, then a significant amount of time for a vehicle to be charged. And for three wheeler sector, there is an unorganization. There is there, there is no organized market for this three wheeler char charging infrastructure. These are typically fed by your uh, what you can say unorganized sector. So they'll just bring a uh, cable from the nearby shop and they'll plug in the electric vehicle charger which is which are, we do not have uh, enough protection they have safety issues they have metering issues so these kind of issues are present in this three wheeler sector then if i come to the four wheeler sector the indian ev market has not reached a critical mass because of this the private players are still not aggressively pushing your electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Now, why the number electric vehicle market is not grown is because it, the cost of electric vehicles are typically high. And the interest rate of these vehicles are also high. And further, if you go for insurance, still, since these technologies are not out in the market for long, long duration, or uh, is not well known by the insurance companies, so the insurance companies charge a high premium for your insurance. Now, if I go for a fast charging station, this uh, a separate power infrastructure needs to be set up because, as you, as you may know, if your load, if a load connected load goes more than 50 kilowatt, generally it's different from 50 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt, then you need a separate uh, transformer and separate uh, separate feeder feeder for to cater to that load. And because of this, since the uh, your charging station has to pay for it, so this is a discouraging factor.
the other uh, issue is the availability of land so india is highly dense and there is lack of available land in the urban localities which is another challenge this land the land that is present in the uh, indian or the uh, indian urban areas is typically owned by its government offices agencies municipal offices uh, so these parking lots they are owned by these municipal systems and currently there is no instrument by which a private party can go and lease out that land to install the charging station and as we uh, and this next is a standardized charging infrastructure so two wheelers and three wheelers they do not have a standardized connector type so every two wheeler model has a different kind of connector due to which they cannot they, it cannot be plugged into a random electric vehicle charger so because of lack of standardization that's an issue so if you look at the indian distribution network then the indian distribution networks are typically highly loaded and therefore there is not enough margin for the addition of electric vehicle load now if i want if there if the electric vehicle loads are to be added then there is a requirement for grid upgradation but the discounts in india are not in a financial position or generally are not in a financial position to have, to pay for an upgradation cost so it becomes difficult for discount to justify to upgrade a system if the evs uh, if the ev market has not grown yet and if the discount pays for upgradation the recovery of the cost is challenging further the in the electrical vehicle policy state policy has been released by the different states in india they have given different ev tariffs or the uh, regulatory commissions of different state the electricity regulatory commissions of different states they have come up with ev tariffs and the government has publicized these tariffs but the tariffs that are shown in the government of in the government publications are typically your the base prices on top of these prices we have different amount of surcharges this uh, taxes which uh, if if a uh, a publicized uh, cost of your tariff is around 6 kilo 6 rupees per kilo what the total net rupees uh, or the net tariff comes around 12 to 14 rupees which is difficult for a charging station uh to bear because a user will look into the uh, rate that is mentioned by the government but their hidden cost so even though you are publishing that cost the actual cost is actually higher therefore it becomes difficult for a charging station operator to men- to stay in business the other is if you go if you want to go into smart charging that is if you want to implement your time of use tariffs for now we need the smart meters uh, in the in the charging stations but the smart meters in india are still like it is under the, it is still under process of being installed so to conclude it uh, vehicle electrification is uh, is rapidly transforming this transportation sector so globally there is a huge surge in the number of electric vehicles that is being sold in the market and right now the 720 kilowatt chargers are being dominant but we expect the rapid and ultra rapid chargers to be aggressively added over the next 4 to 5 years and because of these electric vehicle this high rated power capacity chargers a significant impact on the distribution system would be seen and to control this or to defer the upgradation of uh, this uh, distribution system we the smart charging is one of the promising technologies as a future analogies uh, so uk has given uh, retrofitted this lamp posts and this uh, distribution the light uh, this light post as a kind of uh, of street charging so anyone parking park in the street can use these chargers to charge their vehicles and there is pentagraph charging that is also come up in pentagraph charging so this typically used for your buses so they are high power 200 kw 500 kw chargers which are used to charge these buses I will allow to do this electrified road in Sweden and this wireless electrified road that is also being piloted. So that's it. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask.